So I think like every period of time in this country, we have had a period where writing during that period was was dangerous. Um, but I don't think it should stop us from writing. I don't think it should stop us from telling our stories. From the ACLU, this is At Liberty. I'm Kendall Seesmeyer, your host. Over the past two years, we've seen a dramatic increase in the number of books being banned or challenged in school districts across the country. While there is a long history of book banning and censorship in America, over the 2021 to 2022 school year, book banning reached an unprecedented high. What's even more worrying about this increased censorship is which stories are being censored. The majority of the books being targeted by these bans contain LGBTQ plus storylines and protagonists of color. Here today to talk with us about book banning and how we can all show up in the fight against censorship is George M. Johnson. Their memoir, All Boys Aren't Blue, explores themes of gender identity, sexual orientation, and race as Johnson shares their experience growing up Black and queer in New Jersey and Virginia. All Boys Aren't Blue was published in 2020 and has become one of the top five most banned books in the country. George, thank you so much for joining us. We're really excited to speak with you today. Thank you for having me today. So your memoir, All Boys Aren't Blue, has really taken on a life of its own. But I want to begin by just kind of going back to the beginning when you first started thinking about writing All Boys Aren't Blue. What motivated you initially to write this book? Yeah, my initial motivation, uh, I have been a journalist for several years and I've been writing my story in bits and pieces throughout those years. But there was a death of a young kid named Giovanni Melton. And when the initial reports came out, there was something stated that alluded to the fact that his father said that he would rather have a dead son than a gay son. Um, Hearing that, uh, I continued to write about that story and cover that story But I also knew that it wasn't enough, that more had to be done, more needed to be done. Um, And that really became the catalyst for me to make the decision to put all of those little bits and pieces into a full body of work. Um, I still, at that point, had read many memoirs and I had read many books uh, where parts of me felt seen and parts of me felt heard. But I still wanted to put something else into the world that gave my story uh, to see, you know, who I could connect with out there and to ensure that young Black LGBTQ youth uh, had a story that they felt seen and they felt heard in a way that I hadn't. And so that was really what went into the inspiration for All Boys Aren't Blue. And you've said in prior interviews that you always knew or felt that your book could be banned or was likely to be banned. Why did you think that? Yeah, I just saw the landscape of the country we live in. And uh, it just seemed obvious to me that someone was going to take issue with my book. I'd already seen uh, rumblings around books like The Hate You Give, books like uh, Dear Martin. Mm -hmm. uh, And you know, the End of 1619 Project. And so as I was going through my process of writing the book, I w- in my mind, I was like, okay, if they're coming for those books, they're definitely going to come for mine too. Those other books clearly address Blackness. But I was also talking about queerness and I was talking about uh, a myriad of topics, including racism and anti-Blackness and sexuality. And so I knew the myriad of all the topics I was covering in my book uh, was not going to make a particular group of this country happy. <laughs> Did that change or shape how you approached writing it? I mean, I was like, regardless of how I write, this is going to get banned, so I might as well tell the truth. (laughs) I might as well go all the way out with it, because regardless of how I try to write this, Mm, frame it, mm -hmm. sanitize it, uh, which there were times where I I did think about sanitizing it. It it wouldn't have mattered. Um, They were going to find issue with this book, and they were going to find issue with the book because people find issue with me as a public figure. So um, the two things being attached, uh, I knew was still going to cause banning to occur, no matter how I wrote it. So it only, I guess, inspired me to to write it in uh, its totality with the full vulnerability and transparency that I did. I can imagine that being a liberating, but also kind of terrifying experience to to make the decision to just go all out with your story for anyone to share, like, their story so vulnerably and openly. 
I could imagine that being kind of a, a tenuous process or a tenuous idea to be writing a book that you assumed would be banned. But what actually mostly stands out to me in the book is that you speak openly about the support that you received from your family. I think that's so important to talk about and share because it's not often that we get to hear about a family being openly supportive. Can you tell me a little bit about what that support looked like? Yeah, um, that support was a beautiful thing. It was seamless. It never felt like forced. Like I always felt supported by my family um, from childhood to young adulthood, uh, even throughout my adulthood. My family has always had my back um, with anything that I've done, anything I've written. Um, and even if I did something that was controversial, you know, my family was always going to be my support system. Even when they disagreed, we could talk through the disagreements, but they would still find a way to support. Um, you know, my family always operated from a place of love first and kind of figure everything else out after that. Uh, and so I'm fortunate that I grew up in a family that was extremely loving first. And then, you know, we figured out the whole identity as I was figuring out my identity and language and what I wanted to show up like in the world. Um, you know, so much so that uh, later today, my mom and my two aunts, Aunt Sarah and Aunt Munch, um, are going to a school board meeting um, in New Jersey to defend the book. So um, that's the type of family that I come from. They're going to read a statement that I wrote, but my mom is also going to speak um, to these particular group. It's eight residents of a city uh, close to where I grew up who are trying to ban it. And, you know, I think that's just the reality of what that support looks like so much so that they show up to the places where people don't think we exist. And I think that's the type of support that I've always had. I love that. That's such a gift. Do you feel like that made you more confident in sharing your story? Yeah. And I mean, it still was tough because I still had to face society. And so it's like, even when you can feel like you could be yourself at home or when you're um, feeling you're most safe and most protected at home, it doesn't necessarily mean that it translates directly into when you step out of your house. But I always knew I was loved at home. I was always supported at home. And I think now the person that I get to be today, the person who I am today is a direct reflection of the family that I was raised in and how supportive they were and how they allowed my freedom of expression to be shown out in a myriad of ways throughout my life. And to really show up for you like in person at a school board meeting is really incredible. We really need to show up and actually aggressively argue for not just in a defensive way, but in an offensive way for the accessibility of more of these stories to be in our school libraries and in our curriculums. It, it actually isn't enough to just be defending. I think we often talk about these things in a way of like, defending against the bad people instead of advocating for for good. Either way, it's important. Um, another part of your book that I really appreciated and has been noted by other reviewers is that you chose to depict your sexual experiences vividly and honestly, you know, in a country that uh, provides so little accurate and comprehensive sex education. Why was that an important choice for you? Yeah, it was an important choice because it was like I could write it the same way I learned sex education, which was very sterile. But we are literally putting teens who will become young adults into the world with no frame of reference around agency, consent, non-consent, first experiences, what that experience feels like. And so, you know, people claim, well, that shouldn't be taught in the classrooms. It should be learned at home. And it's like, yeah, but they're not teaching it at home either, because if you feel it's so taboo to learn here, then why would any of us believe that at home you're able to have that hard, difficult conversation where you don't feel that administrators, people who are trained in how to educate the youth can't have that same conversation, right? And I think that's the other interesting point of this too, is like publicly, we can't be having this large discussion around Roe v. Wade and abortion while also saying we're not going to teach teens about pregnancy because you only can have an abortion if you were pregnant. So it's not like we want to remove abortions, but also ramp up what we actually teach about sexual education and ramp up what we teach about condoms and ramp up what we teach about birth control and, and all of those things to provide other access and other resources for teens. And so for me, it was just super important to vividly describe the, that moment because it's a, it's a scary moment. It's a first time moment. It's something you are doing that you have no training for, 
that you have no experience with. And it's like, if no one is telling what their first time felt like, then how do these young adults know how to even enter that space? Um, and furthermore, I think, you know, the whole issues around where people are like shocked and baffled that sexual assault happens at such a high rate on college campuses. And it's like, yeah, because you sent a bunch of 17 year olds, 18 year olds out into the world to live on campuses together with no education around this one particular thing that you know that they are going to partake in. And so that was why I felt it was necessary for me to speak about it in the way I did. It's also, I think, worth noting that that sex education um, for queer people is basically non-existent. Sex, when it is talked about, is only talked about from a very specific lens. It's not inclusive. It's not comprehensive. And so a huge swath of young people are left without any roadmap whatsoever. Yeah, like there is no roadmap. And, you know, if sex education for heterosexual people is already this super sanitized version that looks like it's only a reproductive thing. And we learned about it for a couple of weeks about how the reproductive system works. Let alone people talk about actual like pleasure. Other things that we clearly know people have sex for, right? So again, it's pretty much non-existent for heterosexual people, right. which means it pretty much isn't existed for queer people. Um, and so I also had that mindset as well. And again, I think it would be one thing if I wrote a whole book about that particular subject, but we're really talking about two chapters uh, where I discuss it. And we're only talking about the passages that they take issue with are maybe less than two pages total if you put them all together. So it's like, wow, like if we can't even have this particular conversation. And again, I speak to teens all the time. And so they are having the conversations in even greater depth than my book went into every day. So yeah, there is no roadmap. And I felt like I needed to do something to put something out there. Yeah, I think it's really important. And, you know, to your point about it being like such a small fraction of the book, um, it is really interesting, our obsession and like purity culture and our just new wave of censorship that has narrowed in on your book being problematic for, you know, the, the very small fraction of, of a depiction that you even represent is, I think, <laughs> it's even more baffling, right? Yeah. You would think that I've sold 10 million copies of this book and it was like Fifty Shades of Grey. It's like, like it's selling very well, but I've not sold millions of copies of this book. The primary market or the primary purchaser of this book has realistically been adults. So um, it, it hasn't even reached as many teens as one would believe, um, you know, but the teens that it is reaching is activating them in a, a beautiful way to support and love on queer people. Like they're not caught up on those two chapters. When I, I've talked with thousands of teens, we rarely talk about those chapters. And when we do, we do talk about it from the place of consent and agency and what sexual assault looks like. So it, it's creating a very, very meaningful conversation, but that particular subject is not even remotely close to the majority of questions I get from uh, young adult readers. You call your book a memoir manifesto. How did you decide to use that distinction? And what is that distinction in your mind? You know, before the book bans, I probably had one description of that. Um, but now it really, it's a call to action. And, you know, I think it was putting a story out into the world, specifically in the young adult space that we rarely have ever gotten to see. Um, and I think manifestos oftentimes piss people off. And so um, if it has, I think we've proven the point <laughs> uh, that this book this book was not just a, a memoir, but it was something very, very different that has now created a very, very huge cultural conversation uh, around the ways in which we discuss uh, identity and politics and racism and anti-Blackness and sexuality and gender. And what would your answer have been before the book bans? Before the book bans, I think it was always based and I had felt that the book was something special. Like, I didn't know what that special meant, but I just knew it was something special. And I knew that I was putting words into the world that would inspire and invigorate and um, particularly change lives. And so I think 
I, I didn't think of it from like the sociopolitical perspective as much as I thought about it from the micro individual perspective. And so I think that's now where my juxtaposition is, is where the, the initial intentions of this book was to really help people who read it like on an individual level to really feel seen and heard. And now um, it has a much more macro effect uh, going on with the book bands. I think that actually makes a lot of sense because I, I think about social issues in that kind of micro and macro, like the two planes kind of operating at once, right? Uh, who we are to ourselves and to, you know, our one-on-one connections. And then that causes some kind of ripple effect that does impact systems and does impact structures. And clearly your book was so effective that it did kind of ripple out to become something that was viewed from a structural lens as a threat because we only ban things that are threats to us. So, I mean, I guess job well done in that context. As we mentioned, your book has been banned now. I think it's 29 school districts, according to my latest calculation. Yeah, we kind of stopped counting. It's beyond that. Um, (laughs) Okay. We're just going to wait till the uh, American Library Association lets us know. And I think it's usually around March or April when, and PEN America will let us know what the updated tally is. 29 was probably months ago. Um, Again, like my parents are going to a school board meeting tonight that's not included in the 29. So yeah, we're, we're beyond, and I, I think we are well beyond the 20s or even the 30s at this point. Um, it's hard to keep track. So now it's just kind of like, at, front, at first it was fun to keep track. It was like, oh, another one, oh, another one. Now it's just like, oh, another one. Like, all right, like just keep the tally going. A lot of the authors that I've read that you admire most are some of the people that are also most well-regarded in American literature and also the most banned. You know, Toni Morrison is a of mention, right? How how does it feel to be among the company of your idols? Do you find pride in this? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, like it's bittersweet at times because it's just like, I can't believe they're still attacking Black writing after all these years. But yeah, it feels great. I tell people all the time, like, I love Toni Morrison, everything she means to us. And um, this will probably be the only list I am ever included on with her. So that is a plus for me. Um, And, you know, even when I've talked to those who have been in this industry for a long time, they're like, if you're getting banned, you're probably saying something really, really important, George. And so they're like, because look at the company, you're with Tony, you're with like these other people who understand the importance of this particular type of storytelling. And so um, I do take a lot of pride in it. Um, you know, it, it would be, and it would be one thing if they were actually reading the story, but they're not reading the story. They read the same four passages at every school board meeting. So we know they're not reading the story. Um Because they're always shocked when people bring up other or go up in there and read other passages. And they're almost like, what book is that from? And they're like, the same one you're trying to ban, right? Like you, because you actually have never read the book. So you actually don't know what's in the book. So of course they haven't read the book. Yeah. So, you know, but yeah, I take pride in being uh, included in in that list, Um, even though I still know I have work to do um, because those, you know, those pioneers, you know, put a lot of words into the world. And I'm just beginning to put my words into the world. And so, um, yeah, I think Toni Morrison had 13 books. So that's always the goal for me is, can I get to 13? (laughs) Well, I'm eager to hear about more of the 13. But first, um, you know, all of the five most challenged or banned books in America feature LGBTQ plus characters and or feature protagonists of color. It's not shocking. I think we have seen this backlash brewing. Um, One of the most quoted lines from your book is symbolism gives folks hope, but I've come to learn symbolism is a threat to actual change. It is a chance for those in power to say, quote, look how far you've come rather than admitting, quotes, look how long we have stopped you from getting here. So I thought this was really interesting and I wanted to needle in here. What about symbolism is so tricky? And do you think that we've settled too soon into thinking that symbolism would be enough? And how do you think that this all relates to the rise in censorship that we're now experiencing? Yeah, I mean, symbolism, in my opinion, especially in the United States, is a tool of white supremacy. It's like, you know, what does it mean? Like, okay, like, oh, we had our first Black president and then 
look where we are now, right? Like, so what was the, what did it mean for that symbolic gesture to even happen, right? Um, you know, and then when you look at symbolism on the other side, right? The, the, the notion that, you know, young Black kids attend schools that are named after slave owners, right? Like, you know, it's like, what does it actually mean at the end of the day? Because even if you go to a school that's named after like a Robert E. Lee and you're a black kid, it doesn't take long for you to Google to figure out who that person is. And then what does that make you feel like as a person who, you know, has to attend that and has to live under the veil of that particular type of symbolism? Um, and then, like I said, on the flip side, it's like, you know, Holly Berry is still the only black woman to ever win an Oscar for lead actress. So... What are we? We're almost at a hundred years of the Oscar. So, what was that symbolic? What did that symbolic moment do? It didn't. Unfortunately, it didn't pave a way for for more, right? Um, and we're still having those same type of fights around black creativity and the appreciation of it, right? You know, our mother uh, Beyonce is you know the person with the most Grammy Awards history, but has never gotten the album of the year. And so that's what I think about, like when I think about the juxtaposition of symbolism and what it means to to us as as people who are trying to process it. I also think that symbolism, this big kind of broad symbolism, as you say, it's like not really a sign of progress, but it is enough to terrify the opposition. And I think that in a lot of ways, that's what we've seen in states like Florida. Florida's recent banning of the AP African American Studies course and the college board's subsequent just kowtowing to scrap most of the LGBTQ authors from the course's curriculum are just like the, the latest and greatest attacks on teaching Black histories and narratives in schools. Yeah. What is lost here? I mean, everything is lost. And it's kind of interesting because it's like, we already don't teach enough of Black history to begin with. So it's like, right. we're already at the floor. So it was just like, what is the purpose of this particular movement exactly? Because it's not going to, you know, it's like, I guess trying to remove remove the existence of Black people without removing their existence because we're still here. Like, I don't know. Um, so I'm at, and I'll be honest, like, I'm actually not, Sure. Like outside of racism and anti-blackness, it's just kind of like, I don't know what the end goal is, specifically in a state like Florida. I just don't know what the end game is, um, specifically when that particular politic isn't playing necessarily well. Like it plays well in certain pockets of the country, but it doesn't play well overall in the country. You know, the end game is always white supremacy. So it's just like, OK, um, and I guess antagonism of, of us. Um, in the public eye. But yeah, I honestly, I'm not sure where they're going with that. I mean, I, I wholeheartedly agree that that the end game is is always white supremacy, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think in this particular context, it strikes me as a kind of grab for power among a certain demographic of people where these policies seem to to play well. But as you pointed out, certainly not more broadly than that. I think it's short-sighted from a political perspective, and I think it's disgusting from a humanity, human dignity, like, existing perspective. I also don't understand what the end game is. But, you know, one thing that is also really curious to me is, and I, I wanted to get your take on this, it's all about book banning. And I find that to be interesting in that books are only one form of media consumption. What do you think that books give us that other mediums can't that would make them such like irresistible targets of this kind of censorship? Yeah, books stand the test of time. I think that's pretty much it. And books are a time capsule that are hard to erase and they don't just go into the They abyss. don't disappear in 24 hours. Yeah, so it's not like a social media thing. It's not like a tweet that went viral that you may be able to pull up 10 years later. It's not even like a TV show from the 50s or 60s or 70s or 80s, right? Like, even though you have certain shows that make reruns, there have been thousands of TV shows created. There are only few that make it to a rerun status, you know, where you can see them regularly. And so Toni Morrison's books from the 70s, the 80s, they're still here. So I think that's the real thing with books. I mean, there are books from... I can think of Passing by uh, Nella Larson. That book came out in like 1920. like, And then the movie came out in 20, 
19 or 2020. Like, so a book from 100 years ago was adapted into this work that people loved and appreciated. And so I think that's really the, the difference with books. It's like when these books come into the world, they don't go away. And I think that's also the thing, too. It's like, OK, so we take them out of school systems like All Boys on Blue doesn't go away. Like it still exists at every Barnes and Noble. It still exists at, on Amazon. It exists in multiple languages. It doesn't take the book away. So I'm actually just shocked and baffled. And it does. It makes it more irresistible. Um, and we know that um, as my book is in its 10th reprint, like it's only growing. And again, it's not I have not sold millions of copies. So there are still millions of people who have not tapped into it that this ban is potentially allowing people who would have never picked up this book to pick up. So at the end of the day, I don't fully understand it. OK, so a teen turns 17 or 18 and can just go to the bookstore and get it themselves. One of the concerns we have more broadly is, is that, you know, that this climate can feel really discouraging to forthcoming writers who want to share stories around race or gender, sexuality. I wonder what you would say to people who have a story to share but are perhaps reluctant due to the kind of climate that they would be publishing in? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like when my ancestors had a story to share, the climate they were publishing in was extremely dangerous. You have the slave narratives where they had to change their names, change some of the locations, change some of the names of their families because of fear of being caught by slave catchers, even though they had possibly moved to cities where slavery had already been abolished. But there were still certain laws in the South where a person could still find that person and take them back to the South, even though they were writers and telling their stories about slavery. So I think like every period of time in this country, we have had a period where writing during that period was was dangerous. Um, but I don't think it should stop us from writing. I don't think it should stop us from telling our stories. It is tough and it, it makes the landscape tough and it does make you more reluctant. But I think if you have a story to tell, you should just trust in yourself enough to tell that story. Why are queer and Black stories so threatening and therefore so powerful? Because they are uh, an educational tool that builds empathy between communities of people who never knew that people outside of the bubbles and the worlds that they get to live in exist. And I think that there's a real fear because of Gen Z being going to be the first generation in this country where it's more non-white than white. Uh, because Generation Z is already identifying nearly 20% LGBTQ um, and because Generation Z is going to be the next biggest voting bloc as well as the next future senators, governors, presidents of, of this country, CEOs. If you empower them with the knowledge that other people exist outside of them, because what's not going to change is that those particular people will still primarily be white and male. But if you're able to shift the mindset of the young white male to not be one about rifles and guns and to be one about empathy and uh, understanding how they oppress others and understanding how people have to interact and navigate a world that was created um that set other groups up for poverty and that sets other groups up to be oppressed. And then they actually want to do something about it and they actually want to give equity um, and equality. Um, I think that's dangerous in the minds of the older generation of white men who continue to run this country. Yeah, it feels like a, a last stand or a last kind of grab for power. Yeah. And also, let's be clear, empowering and also empowering white women, right? Because there is a huge divide between white women of the direction of this country as well. And so I think, um, and I don't, I, the word empower is not correct, but like, again, like giving them the knowledge, the resources, the tools about people who exist outside of them and also letting them know that even as a, a woman, you clearly are going to um, have oppressions at your intersection of being a woman, but you also have many privileges because you're still white. And I think that call out, call in that our books are doing is also changing many of the minds of Gen Z who are, again, white men, white women, um, and even white queer people, because a lot of times white queer people don't understand that at the intersection of their queerness and their whiteness, um, that they have also been impressive to black queer people. Um, and so I think our stories give them all of those tools and knowledge to even understand how they show up in the world um, as oppressors and which is why you hear the narrative, like, we don't want to make white kids feel bad. And it's like, I can't be concerned about that when we all feel bad. You know, I think storytelling is a mechanism to create empathy and to build bridges. Um, 
So I think you're, I think you're really right. As we wrap up here, I have a few more questions. I'm looking for a new good read. What's your favorite band book that's not your own? Oh boy. Um, my favorite band book. I'm like, there are so many band books to choose from. I know. It's a tough question. Let me think. Uh, God, there's so many of our books being banned. Um, I'm always going to tell everybody to read Dear Martin. Um, I think that Nick Stone was brilliant in the ways in which um, she wrote that book. I'm always going to tell everyone to read Jim DeQueer. Um, I think that was another brilliantly uh, written book. The book that I'm currently reading is called Promise Boys, um, and it's amazing. And so I'm, I'm like, so Promise Boys, because I actually do feel like that will get caught up in the bands um, at some point. I love how you just rattle off a list. Thank you so much for sharing all about the the backlash and the banning of your book. But I also just want to talk about the community that's really rallied around it. Your book has received a special recognition award from GLAAD. And The Root placed you on its list of 100 most influential people. What has it been like to receive this response from the Black and queer and reading communities? What has that been like? It's been amazing. Um, you know, it's tough as a Black queer person to know if your work's going to be supported sometimes within your own community, because we're still dealing with homophobia and transphobia and misogyny, just like any other community is. And so it's been great to see um, many of the institutions and, and people and places rally around the book. Um, it's still more to be done. Um, I still think that you know, there are other Black institutions and organizations that could do better about um, speaking up for us while we're in this fight over curriculum, realistically, and over our stories to be told. But I do think I'm seeing the, the, the pathway be bridged. And so I think that's a beautiful thing. And, you know, like, even being recognized, I was recognized by Time magazine. And so, you know, like, that's a big, that was a big, like, you know, to be considered one of the next uh, most influential people in the world. Like, that's a big thing because it also means that this book is not just a, a Black queer story for Black queer people, that it is now a global story that um, can reach many people um, and inspire other people to tell their stories of their intersections. So, yeah, it's a beautiful thing. I love that. Um, so I had to ask, but last question about your upcoming book, Flamboyance, Queer Stories from the Harlem Renaissance, I Wish I'd Knew. The title itself sounds like an exploration into the importance of storytelling and having access to these histories, which really just ties this whole conversation together. Is the book nonfiction? Can you share a little bit with us uh, about how you came to this idea? Yeah. So um, originally I was looking at Vashti Harris's books, uh, Little Leaders, um, which is an amazing series that goes back in time and kind of like talks about like these powerful people who were in, in the past, Black people. Um, and so from there, I was like, oh, maybe I should do like a picture book of like the Harlem Renaissance people. Like that would be cool. Um, but, you know, as we kept talking through it, it was like, no, George, I think we want more of your voice. We want your style. We want like bring it all home to us about how these Black queer people existed. Um, many people know some of their stories, but some of the stories have been whitewashed. Some of the stories have been um, misconstrued. Their queerness has been erased from them. And so um, that's what I'm doing. I'm going back to tell the stories of our past uh, as a person who lives in the present to let you know, the world know that we have existed in different time periods. A lot of times people think queerness is some new thing, and this is how we start to push back against that narrative because it's it's always existed. Uh, it'll be a mixed media format. That's typically how I write. So it's not a traditional like biographies. Um, so it'll be a lot of different styles I'm testing out. And when can we expect that? That book can be expected May of 2024. Amazing. Um, okay. Yeah. So the draft, the third draft is due next Friday. So I need to oh, get man. to work on it. Um, <laughs> so you're so, yeah. saying we should let you go? So you can go work on the book. <laughs> I do. I literally, I'm going to work on the book today. <laughs> very, very exciting. Well, um, so well-deserved, all the success that you've had. I, I think that, you know, they're right in saying that if your book is getting banned, you probably have something important to say. And um, it's it's really clear that 
you have many important things to say, not just one important thing to say. We're expecting the 13 important things that you have to say. No pressure. Um, thank you so much, George, for joining us and, and for sharing your story and your perspective. Um, we really, really appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe to At Liberty wherever you get your podcasts and rate and review the show. We really appreciate the feedback. Until next week, keep showing up.